is to maintain and promote the standard of conducting for real estate agents, regulate the activities of estate agents and having due regard to the public interest. The board achieves regulation through preventing unsuitable persons from entering the industry. This means that we try to make sure that all the estate agents are qualified and registered at the board. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the, stu uh, the student or the agents that's not qualified, unfortunately, they will have problems. Administrating a qualifi and qualify examination. Investing complaints concerning improper estate agency conduct, imposing disciplinary on estate agents, reimbursing customers who suffered financial loss through the benefit of estate agents. Now, there's different uh, related legislations. Now, the different laws to take in consideration in real estate. Um, I've mentioned a few here. There's still some others left. But I thought let's just mention a few. Your Rental Act, we all know most of you uh, are, are either tenants or you've got a property that you rent out. Everything is also under the Housing Act. Then Common Law is also part of the Contract Law. Consumer Protection Act is there as well to uh, protect the consumer and um, we are, uh, the, it's the real estate agents, there's quite a few things under the Consumer Protection Act that is for um, our, and I must say it's not really for our advantage, it's more for the advantage of either the tenant or the landlord. Then the Poppy Act, that is the security where we cannot, like in the uh, future, just pull people's name and call them what we call hot calling. Spluma Act, thank you, it's still not in... Um, Gauteng, um, in Mapumulanga, you have to have a Spluma certificate before you can register, and that is a costly certificate, actually. Uh, you have to get an engineer to look at your um, foundations and if your building is up to standard. Then you get your ordinary contract law, your Property Practitioners Act, and the new bill is also now under that. The new Credit Act, the Direct Marketing Act, Customary Law, FICA and Financial Intelligence Center, Deeds Registered Act, Property Pr Practitioner Act, Money Laundering Act, and that is quite a big act. We are not going to go into depth on, on the, these acts. Foreign Sellers, Land Use Control Act, Sectional Title Act, Share Block Schemes, but what we're going to do today is to just touch on some of the acts and then talk about the contracts because we all need to sign a contract at a stage, either for purchase or as an estate agent uh, to uh, sell a property. General provisions of the act. The general provision is to provide the establishment of an estate agency affairs board and an estate agency affairs fidelity fund for the control of certain activities of estate agents in the public interest and for incidental matters. Provisions of the Act. A specific description of estate agent means that if you are a state agent, you must, your na company name and your name must be in the contract. Requirements to be complete, complied with is the persons intending to become estate agents and by existing and purchasing part estate agents, disciplinary action by the Estate Agents Affairs Board, the Estate Agents Affairs Board objectives, the Estate Agents Fertility Funds protects members to the, of the public, the defini definition of, and regulation of the Fidelity Fund and Trust Account, um, Estate agents must see operating, a sanction for estate agents. So there's quite a lot of uh, different scenarios that is described under the Act. Now, the Property Practitioner Act. This is the new Act as well that is coming in um, on the 3rd of October 2019. The President promulgated the Property Practitioners Act which brings out a very important area in the history of the real estate sector in South Africa. 
The name of the real estate agency fees board to be, be replaced as the property practitioner regulatory authority. Now, currently it has not been implemented, so we're waiting for the day that it is come, and it will also then um, work under the land um, somewhere there. Uh, so the whole department is going to move. But in principle, most of the, the re uh, regulations, the code of conduct will stay the same. There will just be slight changes. Now, the act, it say, you will see there is an, uh, we talk now as an intern agent. That will change to a candidate property practitioner. Currently, we talk about a full status agent. We will then name a property practitioner. A principal estate agent will be a property, principal property practitioner. And the estate agents affairs board will be the property practitioner regularity authority. And the fidelity fund will be the property practitioner's fidelity fund. So there's just a few name changes that's going to happen. But in principle, the idea will stay the same. Any questions up to you? No questions? No. Okay. Then we get the financial information. Pardon? You can talk, really. Oh, oh, no, no, it's okay. okay. I'm saying we are good. Okay, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act. The state agent must keep the records. Now, this is where uh, it is law. We know with SARS as well, you have to keep your records for five years. Even here, we have to keep records. Sorry, is there any questions? Okay, the line is just very bad. Okay. Uh, you can still see everything, the screen and what to call. Yeah. Um, so we must also keep the records. Ne? If the client is acting on behalf of another person, identify. That is the very important thing of FICA. You have to identify the client. You must know with whom are you talking. It, the brother or the sister cannot come and buy on behalf of that person. You must see who is your real client. Obtain copies of the form of identification furnished by the client and the client's representative. So, meaning if there's a client and he is, um, you must see who he is, you must get all his FICO documentation, where does he stay, copies of his ID. What is he going to uh, That is the main thing. Where is the money coming from? You must keep these documents in file together with all the source of documents provided by the client. And um, you must keep that file for five years. Also, in any estate agency company, we will have a FICA officer, meaning that if we sign an offer to purchase and everything is done, that FICA officer will then check if all the documentation is there. And otherwise, there can be a comeback for you and for the company. And if there's a, a, a offence committed in the FICA, it is an uh, imprisonment of 15 years or a fi fine of 10 million. And no one else, nobody would like to do that. So we prevent that. Then foreign sellers. Purchaser is obliged to withhold a certain amount of the purchase price and pay it over to SARS if the seller is a non-resident and the purchase price exceeds two million. And you know what is nice? That is the, the, the work for the attorney. It is not our business. So the attorney will make sure that will happen. At the end of the period, the attorney must just give you a letter to say uh, what happened. The state agent and conveyance in the transaction are both obliged to inform the purchaser in writing if the seller is a non-resident. If withholding tax is payable to SARS and not paid, the purchaser can be obliged to pay and the state agent and conveyancer may both be obliged to forfeit the fees they would have earned on the transaction to SARS. Now, 
if you sign an offer to purchase, that is one thing that I always look at. The first uh, uh, paragraph is that, is there a clause in that contract to say that each party is obliged to pay their own taxes? You must never sign an OTP if that is not in, because otherwise this will happen. If any of the parties does not pay their tax, then the, the, the onus is on all the parties to pay the tax. In. Anything unclear on that one? Anything? Any questions? Good. Everything's good. No questions? Everybody happy with the tax? Be and remember, your um, tax must be quite up to date. Yes. Somebody wanted to talk? Somebody wanted to Hi, Rita. Hi, Ntombi. Uh, re regarding the tax, um, yeah. is it me, the agent, who's liable for my own tax? that I must make sure that I is paid. We are in the estate agency company. Uh, we will, the moment you receive your commission, uh, yeah. we will we will take tax off a uh, pro rata. I think it's between 18 and 25%. And we pay it over to tax. Um, okay. And you get an, uh, also from us an ERP at the end of the year to tell you, uh, you know what you must do. Um, you are part of our POMAT group and there um, the principal is also an accountant. So she will help you You can to submit your tax as well if it's needed, uh, if you don't have somebody like that. So uh, in POMAT, we will help you with that. It's not a problem. Okay, it's noted, yeah. Yeah, any, any other questions? Because the tax is very, very, very important. And it's not only for foreign sellers, it is for general. Uh, any party can be obliged for the other party's tax if it's not being paid up. And remember, if your tax is not paid up, you cannot either buy or sell your property because they ask you for your tax clearance certificate. Your National Credit Act, although as, as an estate agent, if it's a sale, not rental, on rental it's different. On a sale, we do not really work directly with the credit bureaus to, to see if this client will qualify. What we do is we make use of a bond originator. Now, I don't know if you all know what is a bond originator. It's a person that is connected to all the banks and they submit uh, the bond application to all the banks and they can qualify a client on the there and the bank system to see is there any bad debts that that client might have against his name that will prevent him from getting a bond. So I say it's better if we do it through the bond originator because the banks are more lenient to bond originators sometimes mm -hmm. to get the loans through because they know exactly where to uh, make an application. And um, we, we've got a very good um, connection with that. Also, the other reason why we prefer a bond originator is if it happens that um, a, pur a purchaser uh, gets a bond sign maybe at Standard Bank and at Net Bank, but is a, maybe a Standard Bank client. So Standard Bank approves a bond and maybe it's less 0.5% of the prime rate. Um, and Net Bank see this is a very good client. They would like to have this client on their books. Then they might approve the bond with maybe less 1% or 1.5%. So we try to get the best deal with interest for the client. And we must, the only thing that I prep the client beforehand is to say it's not necessarily that his own bank will give him the best uh, option 
to buy this property. If he insists only on his own bank, he's got the right to do so. But in the contract, it says that we as an estate agents are also liable to help the client to uh, get a bond. So if it happens that his own bank declined him and he has not paid uh, an application from the other banks, the seller can insist on that or uh, the seller can take him up for breach because he must do a proper application. I've seen an ad this morning where SA Home Loans um, comes in now to say that they actually give a pre-approval certificate. Now, I urge you actually when you are an estate agent and you've got a client, let's do a pre-approved application from Home Loans or any other banks that's willing to do so. Because if they've got that certificate, if they are already approved to purchase, meaning if they find a house, sign the OTP, that purchase will go smooth and it will be faster because it's already two-thirds down the line. With the National Credit Act, it is very important as well to get all the information from the buyers uh, and from the sellers, you know, IDs, um, uh, proof of rest, uh, municipality accounts, uh, outstanding bond ac uh, accounts. Some owners doesn't want to give it to you, but if they don't want, it's fine. And then as well, um, the body corporate rules, if it's in an estate, that is very important. Land use control. And I think the students that's here that uh, was part of our mentorship is got an advantage on this one because you know that if you look at a property uh, like that in uh, uh, one that I showed as a, a template, it's maybe a commercial property and um, it's not zoned for commercial but it's used currently for commercial. Uh, it's always good to do that homework to make sure that it is used for what it's zoned. Remember when you sell it, or that if it's a business and you take a client out there to do business and it comes up later, maybe he wants to change something and or the municipality come around and say, now you have to break down because it's not a business, it's now uh, or it's a residential, not a business. Then he's got a claim actually because he bought something that he cannot actually use, although the current owner is using it for business. So, and to do your um, land use controls, you must know there is a uh, um, town planning department at the municipality, and there's a system where that application will go through. In total, it's 18 departments before the zoning can actually take place. Uh, place. So th that is just a general, this is not part of this course, uh, but to give you an idea uh, for the zoning. Also the land, what happens there is on the zoning is you get your floor area ratio, your coverage, your height, your density. This is nice if you intend selling development land because you will get your approvals and the approval will then say what is the floor area ratio that you can build there, what is the coverage on the land and what is the height and what is the density zones. And it will be so nice to know that, especially the ones of yours that is going into the development or intend selling developments, how to work out your configuration on this, how many units can you build there, is it worth it, what is the price, do a valuation on the property and the price then. And this we will um, take in more careful in detail in the full course. Property ownership. Ownership is a right of complete and abs absolute control over a property by the owner. Rights and obligations. You get freehold ownership. You know what is a freehold ownership. It's a lo loose freestanding houses where there's one property on uh, a piece of land, then you get a lease hold, pardon, don't they? Oh no, I was saying yes. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. And then you get a lease hold title, 
Um, that comes up sometimes on the lease out title. Um, you, ne- you, you get old age homes, not really the old age homes, it's retirement villages. It's like a life thing. You, 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 you rent for a certain period, a long period. Then you get your sectional title. We all know sectional title. It's all the flats and uh, every place uh, uh, where we stay, that is sectional title. Now, something about sectional title that's quite interesting is that maybe you bought a sectional title unit and you've got a little balcony and maybe you've got a garden and uh, a garage and a carport you must remember what you buy of a sectional title is only the inside of your flat we always joke to say that you know a a, a wall is two bricks width so the one brick is for you and the other brick is for your neighbor up to your ceiling the only thing outside that unit is the geezer. The rest is all the ownership of the body corporate. Did you know that? Mm. Any questions on this one? Your garage, your garden, your uh, carport is for your usage. But you don't own them. Bondly? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that is your sectional title. Fractional ownership. Sometimes they can register it other as a share block, but it's not actually a share block. It's more sectional title. It is a very interesting thing, especially when you've got a holiday home. Uh, it is so much easier to, to do it under fractional title ownership. Um, I think the development, the, the people who wants to do developments himself, this is something that you can definitely look into. And we can talk more about it in the full course, or you're welcome to call me afterwards. Share book block schemes that we know, you know, the, your RS, RM, what is it, RCI and holiday clubs, that's all share blocks. Property ownership. Who is the owner of an immovable property? Not a legal requirement that the seller of immovable property be the owner of the property at the time of the sale. A non-owner may sell a property, but only the owner can transfer ownership to the purchaser. Meaning, say for instance, you've got a property and uh, you are maybe out of the country and you want to sell the property. Then you can give your brother a power of attorney to sell this property on your behalf. Um, but the documentation that needs to be signed at the uh, attorney for transfer, that must be signed by you. The, uh, the, the person who's got power of attorney does not have the power to sign unless that power is being registered at the deeds office and that um, they can, um, that he can sign on that documentation. Prescription, a person can become the owner of a property by prescription, provided that he has in possession of the property for an uninterrupted period of 30 years, openly as if he were the owner. It is very unusual, however, for a person to become an owner of a house through pres- prescription. Expropriation, state of other authorized institutions may expropriate property and thereby acquire ownership of the property. Ownership vest in the expropriating pro- body on the date of expropriation even though the property is registered in the former owner's name. Marriage in community of property. Spouses married in community of property are co-owners of any immovable property, forming part of the joint estate and which is registered in the name of one of the spouses. 
A spouse, therefore, becomes a co-owner even though the property is not registered jointly in his or her name. And that can happen. Say, for instance, you, uh, you or your husband bought a property before marriage. Now you get married and you're married in community of property. Then when that property gets sold, both of you have to sign. And that is when you're in community of property. The same can happen out of community of property when you marry and you say, you know, um, you know from today on, it, what's yours is mine and mine is also yours. Uh, then you must also sign. So there is, uh, you, it's better when the attorney wants to register that the attorney must make, make double sure that all the po necessary parties have signed on the uh, uh, registration documentation. Insolvency of registered owner. The estate of an insolvent, including immovable immo property, forming part of the estate, vests the master of the high court until a trustee is appointed. An unrehabilitated insolvent may not sell or let any property forming part of his insolvent estate and may not, without the written consent of his trustee, conclude any other contract which adversely affects his estate. If an insolvent sells property which was acquired by him after the register sequestration, the sale is valid notwithstanding the fact that the trustee's consent has not been obtained, provided the purchaser did not know and had no reason to suspect that he was dealing with an insolvent. Transfer of ownership. Any questions up to you? Uh, Rina, we seem to have lost your screen again. The screen is gone. Oh my. I think it's getting cold. Is it there? Yes, we can see. Yes, 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 yes. yes we can Thank see. You. Thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, any questions up to insolvency? Okay, transfer of ownership. Ownership passes to a purchaser only on the registration of the property in their name in a deeds registry. Purchase, our purpose of this registration system is to ensure the sheer security and certainty of an owner's title of the property. Only in limited cases does the registration not reflect the correct little pro uh, the correct title to the property. Example, prescription, expropriation, marriage, in community of property and insolvency. Now, we've got the deeds office. Um, I don't know if you all know what's going on in the deeds office, except for nowadays they are more close because of the COVID than what they open. But the <laughs> deeds office... <laughs> under the Deeds Registry Act of 47 of 1937. My goodness. The Deeds Registry Act serves to regulate the functions and laws related to title deed transfer, as well as a successful registration of title deeds in South Africa. The Deeds Office functions in cooperation with the Office of the Surveyor General and all the land in South Africa is surveyed and framed by diagrams or general plans. The land registration system in South Africa is known as the cadastral system and regarded as one of the best and most accurate systems in the world. The Act is founded in the following principles. Every land portion must be capable of being identified. Each portion of land in South Africa must therefore um, uh, be this deposed on a diagram and has been drawn up by a land surveyor and approved by the Surveyor General. Each land portion, real right, can only be acquired by means of registration in the deeds office and the person to whom transfer has been passed on registration is then deemed to be the owner of the property. Registration in the deeds office is regarded as notice to the whole world that the real right has been legally transferred to a particular person or entity. Now, the title deed. 
Um, I must tell you, this is the main important document ever in your life. You can lose your marriage certificate. You can lose everything, but you cannot lose a title deed. If a title deed is lost, it's a very big headache. Although there's a copy at the deeds office, it takes them sometimes ages to get that copies. So the title deed is an important document containing information about the property. Any member of the public is entitled to inspect the title registers and other records in the deeds registry. Only qualified conveyances and notaries public are allowed to lodge, submit for approval, title deeds or other real rights with the deeds registry. So we, you cannot go and submit it. And it's very important. Um, sometimes even if a property is re uh, uh, registered for say race two or three, it's good to look at a, a title deed as well. Um, there's a property in Pretoria. Uh, I don't know if you all know Sautpansberg Road where the new uh, foreign fair building is just under the mountain there. There's a big piece of land there. The original owner of that land did write into his title deed that property will never be used for residential purposes. Now, there is other laws and acts to say, um, you know, if I think it's 50 years, after 50 years it can be reviewed. But up to that 50 years, nobody can do anything with that property. So sometimes it's good to have a look to see if there's no other conditions in a property. Now, if you look at this, pardon, just somebody say something. No. Yeah, it's the, by what you're saying about that land. That land is dead. You can't do anything there. You can put sheep there. Where is the owner? Is she or yeah, he me. still alive? No, he's not alive anymore, but he wrote it into his title deed and his siblings and everybody will not be able to do anything with that property. So he was uh, he was either upset with somebody when he did that, I think. He should have been. Okay. Yeah. Now, I choose uh -huh. this week. Rina? Yes. Um, on that note of the title deed and the notes that you can make, so I can make notes on the title deed of my house to say what do I want it to happen to in the next coming years? Um, it is the usage, not for your children. Yeah. It's not, uh, if, if I understand it correctly. So if you've got a okay. big site, so you've got a property and maybe you've got one house there and you decide, uh -uh, I'm not going to sell this property for flats. I'm tired of all the flats around me. This property will stay one residential property. Then you can, and you can put that clause in the contract, but then you have to pay. It's, it's also a costly uh, pl uh, thing to do. So yeah, you can the network you, is actually. Uh, are you back, Moses? Rina? Yes, Moses. Okay. Can you hear me? I think Moses battled with his network today. Yeah, yeah. you can continue, Rina. I think okay, it's that's... just Moses' network alone. Yeah. Um, I, I took this as a picture. This is your whole transfer process. You start here. It looks like a monopoly. Don't you think so? I thought it was quite nice. So you get the... I'm, yes, I'm... I've, been, I've been here in, uh, a while, so, but continue. You want to try to carry on, Moses? Okay, let me carry on. I think Moses suffer there. Okay, this this is quite a nice one. It looks like a monopoly thing. I thought by myself, I think we must print this out and play it, then everybody will understand it. So here's your start. In your start, you've got the pre-sale process where you, you've got the agents, you test your agents, uh, who's going to sell, where are you going to sign your mandate, you, pro, you offer your property for sale here, and then you got your offer to purchase, and then you get your finance. You see, in this portion, 
your, the people involved will be your seller, your estate agent, your buyer, and your mortgage originator. Now it turns around and it goes to the financial process where you apply for the funding. This, this is the this part of the financial process. You get your credit assessment and you get your FICA property Irina. valuation. Yes, Moses. Is there again? Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Then you get your FICA process. This is all part of your financial process. So who's involved there? It's your bank, CIPRO, the deeds office, because you have to get a copy of your uh, title deed, your Experian, where you do your uh, FICA and your credit assessment, TransUnion, also credit assessment, because most some banks work on different um, programs. You get your surveyor general. It's so important to make sure that your land is, uh, your prior house is being built inside the boundaries. You get home affairs because they have to double check that are you married in community property or are you divorced? Maybe you're divorced and they must check that. And then the valuator because the valuator must come out to have a look and get your bond approved. So this is very nice. This is, the, that, this is what is involved there. Then when your bank, your property has been approved, you got your uh, quotation and you accepted the quotation. Now the, the attorney process. Now the attorney process, the bank will instruct the, the bank attorney for the uh, bond. And then you get your registration attorney and you get your document compliance. So the attorneys here must get everything ready. So you've got a bond attorney and you've got a transfer attorney and you get a cancellation attorney. Now, how does it work? Say, for instance, you've got a property, you purchase a property now, but there is a bond on that property. That bond has nothing to do with you. You do your own application. Maybe that bond was with FNB. You've got a, a bond approval from SA Home Loans. And... ESA Home Loans will appoint their own attorney to take care of their affairs to register the bond on your property. Then you get a cancellation attorney from the bank, APSA maybe, uh, who's got the, prop the bond on the current property. APSA will instruct their attorney to cancel the bond because it's different documentation, everything, and that bond attorney will take care of APSA's uh, interest. And then you get a transferring attorney. Now, the transferring attorney, it actually, the, the seller appoints the transferring attorney. So he's taking care of the uh, seller's interest, but also, um, although the seller appoints him, he must make sure that the purchaser is covered and everything is there. So the three attorneys together will submit together at the deeds office and what we always say they link the transaction so that the one will go it will be like one packet they will register the same day and then the transfer attorney their job is to make sure they get your final the municipality rights SARS. something that's not here is the coc certificate that is also needed uh, for the transferring documentation. So the moment all this is done, they've signed the documentation, they've drawn up all the documentation, and now they're ready to lodge at the uh, at deeds office. Now, you get your lodging attorney. Most of the time, it is the transferring attorney. But it can be any one of these attorneys because it depends who is staying the closest to the property. Because if the property is in Pretoria and the bank appointed a cancellation attorney in Johannesburg, obviously then the Johannesburg attorney cannot do the lodging. Uh, so the, if none of them is close by, they will, between them, appoint a lodging attorney who will actually just lodge and they will pay them. So it's not no, no for nobody's cost. So when it's lodged at the ditch office, you, there's a process at the deeds office. 
I think it's a process of five uh, different departments where your uh, transaction will go through. They call it level one, level two, level. They have to work on levels. So you've got your registration of the bond. You've got your attorney process. The attorney, and then once it's registered, yeah, the, if they say, you will hear the word very often that it is on prep. Prep means that everything is done at the deeds office. The attorney must now go and look. Maybe um, the COC certificate, the electric certificate, has been um, declined for what reason. Then they must just quickly get a new certificate. They've got five days to sort out your any problems that's on that file. If there's no problems, the next day the attorney can go. There's stamps that he must put on the uh, 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 title deeds, and then he can sign off and it's registered. Once it's registered and they come back to the office, you will always hear a registration attorney. You cannot talk to them before 11, 12 o'clock if when they come back from the deeds office, they will hand the documentation to the secretary and then the secretary will immediately request the bank for the uh, money to be paid over to them. So they will collect all the money and then they will pay individually to each attorney, the cancellation attorney, the bond attorney and the seller, uh, the agent, whoever needs payment, they will then do that. Any questions on this? Uh, Rina, are you with me? Yes. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the information that you have provided to us right now. And uh, I heard you talking about the importance of uh, title deed. But now my question uh, relates to the ordinary people who are living in the rural communities. Yes. The question is, is it, is it is it possible for one to own a land without a title deed from municipality? I think, Mr. Ramabu, uh, Moses, maybe can you help us there? Because we had this discussion the other day, and my view is no, but he said yes, it is. It depends on the rural area. Is it part of the, the tribal land? because there is other rules and regulations there that I'm not familiar with, I must be honest. So basically what happens is um, normally uh, traditional land, it's under the custodianship of the, the chief. So anyone who stays there, it's called communal land. Anyone who stays there, they don't have a direct title deed to the land. So you are almost like um, you have a right to occupy. It's a shared land, basically. It's for everybody who's there. The chief is that is a custodian on behalf of the people. Um, we have a situation in case and where there is the Nyama Trust, which the trust is the one that holds um, the custodianship of, of, of the land. Um, but in general, communal land, you don't necessarily have the direct uh, title deed. They give what they call, I think, right of to occupy. And the banks um, can still fund. I mean, the former VBS was one of the, um, the banks that was actually willing to give a bond uh, on such. The, there's also the, in KZN, there is, I think, it E2, but trust, something like that. Um, they also, into a bank, it's still there. They are able to give a bond to someone who's staying in a tribal land or in the communal land. Thank you. All right, I think it's quite clear, Rina. Thank you very much. Okay, you are happy further on? Yes, uh, most definitely. Any because, questions? You know, the, yes. the reason yeah. I'm asking this is, the reason I'm asking this question is because I came across uh, a, a number of cases uh, from uh, the so-called townships, but I was, you know, I was surprised why other people have, have the title deeds and others don't have, but in the same township, you know. But now, uh, from uh, understanding the the, 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 the answer uh, from Sir over there, I, I think now I've got the answer for that. 
Yeah, I think before you purchase, make, uh, you must make double sure, is it really the tribal land? Because then it will be under that conditions. Or is it just somebody that wants to sell and you don't, the, this originally a title deed? Because I know uh, there was a case that uh, was on my table at a time where there was actually a title deed. But the people was, um, uh, it was not fraudulent. It was just not, they didn't know uh, what is a title deed and for wh what reason is it there. And they didn't know that they must post on the title deed. So they thought they're just going to sell the property. So um, I think it's also a case where we must start training the people what is a title deed so that they know when they sell the property that rather go through the uh, legal process. Just quickly, Rina, to, to get in on that, what has happened recently with the townships is like in Soshanguve, Mamilodi, I think number of townships. So there are two things uh, as far as title deed is concerned. There is land that has been claimed back by the tribal authorities. Um, so those type of land, they will not necessarily, if you get a stand, I mean, I know in Soshanguve what they've done is they've just given to the young people who were staying there. So they got the, the land back from the land claim, but uh, instead they just gave their stands out to young people who are there. So anyone who stays there will not necessarily have a title deed. It will be treated like tribal land. But then there's also Moses. Moses. Okay, we will we will help him to talk when he comes back because I really would like to know what he says. Um, the duties of the deeds office are stipulated um, in the Deeds Registry Act and the regu uh, regulations of the Act. The register is a semi-judicial officer and the decisions are still subject to the inherent powers of the High Court. Conveyances are the product line and the deeds office serves as quality control, and you've got the examiners, and you get you get you get your chief register. The deeds office consists of the following sections: management section, examining section, strong room section, and I must say they really work hard to make sure that there's no problems on a registration. The chief uh, surveyor general shall be in charge of such cadastral surveying and land information services. Now, this is my last slide, uh, the individual activities. We are going to put this on the uh, MLS program that we've got. And tomorrow, Mr. Munasi will come in and he will explain to you the uh, program so that you can actually get all these slides from there. And the activity is, I want to know what is a title deed and what does it look like? Who has access to title deeds and how? What is the link between deeds, la title deeds, lands, use control? And what is real estate agents' functions with regards to title deeds? Masehu will also mm -hmm. send you these activities. Huh? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Please. Mm. Okay. No questions on my side, Rina. When 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 do we have to submit, Rina? Uh, you can just submit it on the system, or you can email it to Masehu. She can also give it to us, so that on Friday we can quickly look through everything, if possible. Um, so yeah, that is what. And any questions, you're most welcome to on uh, ask. We've got time for questions now. Let's see if Moses uh, is gone. He's really got a problem with his network tonight. Any yeah. questions? Hi, Rita. Hello. Yes, it's Patricia. Um, Hi, Patricia. 
My big interest is in property development, which you know that I'm already taking part in that. Yes. And in the beginning, you helped us to understand the difference between estate agent and property practitioner. I want to find out, because my main interest is mainly on, on being a property practitioner. This process, if I have it to enroll in this program, Will it take me through to property practitioner or only as an estate agent? Okay, the, the, it's going to change. The name estate agent is going to change. That is what is in the beginning. Uh, let me just go back to that first slide. Uh, you will see there, I, I did show, uh, the names are going to change uh, from the um, new, from the property, what we call now an estate agent. Um, it will come to a property practitioner. So you will be called a property Your screen practitioner. is not there. Okay. There is, you see that. Now we talk about this. This is the language we talk now. The Estate Agents Affairs Act, and we say the intern estate agent. We talk about full status agent, principal agent, estate agents affairs board, fidelity fund. This is the language we talk now. But this is the new language coming in. We property Practitioner Act, candidate property practitioner, meaning if you are an intern agent, it will change to proper, uh, a candidate. Then a full status agent will be a property practitioner. That's what you say you want to be. And uh, we, we, our aim is on the training on poor mat is we want all of you to get qualified to be a principal property practitioner. And the Estate Agents Affairs Board will change to Property Practitioner Regularity Authority. And the Fidelity Fund will still be the Property Practitioner Fidelity Fund. So the it is just name changes and the department changes and nitty-gritty changes. But the, in principle, the, the work will still be the same. I think the Code of Conduct will also just have a few name changes in it. But they cannot really change the fact that there is a trust account and that you can claim against a trust account or we must sign mandates. They cannot really change that. So we might get a new document with a little bit new things in, but in principle, the framework will stay the same, I think. Okay, so basically, you just need to be a property practitioner and you can do both. You are in property development you are doing estate agent, you just need that uh, one um, qualification. You see, yeah, you see them as a developer. Let's take developer. Development and a developer, actually, it's got nothing to do with a property practitioner or an estate agent. Because your aim there is to get land, to build, and to, to make money. It's a business. But now you've got maybe a building of, say, 200 units. And you would like to manage that building yourself. If you are not a registered estate agent, you are not allowed to manage that building itself because that is one new thing that comes into the act to say that if a developer or an investor has got more than three properties of his own that he managed, and a qualified estate agent must manage it. And basically the reason for that is, you know, um, if you do your own properties, um, you do not really, or most of the, the, the uh, developers don't do the proper FICA, they don't do the proper credit uh, checks. If you rent an apartment out without a proper credit check, and it happens that the tenant does not pay you and you get to court. The court first thing is going to ask you, did you check if this client can pay you? Is he able to pay you? Is he, is he really working where he says he's working? And that is some things that we in the real estate, we train you how to do that. What What is legally what you must legally do to make sure before you put a tenant in apartment so that if something might happen and you have to land up in court, 
that everything is in order. Inspections, everything, everything. And that is why I think that the, it is enforced for the uh, developers, if it's more than three tenants, to um, that an estate agent. So if you train yourself to become an, an estate agent, to become your own manage, a property manager, you know, it's for your advantage. Oh, I think that's quite good, Rina, because um, that's the intention anyway, to find us ourselves managing our own property and or properties. And you're saying through this um, qualification, all that we'll be able to do in the yes. end. In the end, when you've qualified on your NK4 and you're a full status uh, agent, uh, meaning you are a qualified property practitioner, then you might be able to uh, do it yourself. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are you currently registered with an estate agency company? No. Permit is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on my way. I'm just waiting for Friday and my application will be on your table. Definitely. We're busy with training. We are here there tonight with training. And um, maybe I can just, I'm not really allowed. We've lost you somewhere. I'm not really allowed to say it, but Paul Matt is going to franchise. So uh, <laughs> one of these days, we just want to get everybody ready and everybody set up. And then maybe you can have your own branch of Paul Matt. How does that sound? That sounds beautiful. Yes, please. Join us back south. <laughs> yes, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And all the training is online, yes. But um, I, although I said, Paul, that we are, you can register with any company. <laughs> any other questions? Julius? <laughs> Hello. Yes, Hello. Julius, can I help you? Come, a question. We, we have to have a few questions, please. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to know uh, the slides. Where are we going to get the slides? The slides will be up. Uh, Rina? On the... Yes. Maybe let me clarify the issue of yeah. the slides, right? Yeah. So with regards to the slides, we have a system called a learner management system. So basically, it's an interactive system where uh, facilitators post material and learners download the material. Now, the thing is, to be able to access the learner management system, one should have registered for this course, right? After you register for the course, you should have received a student number with a password to be able to access the learner management system. Then once you have those, when you get into the learner management system, there's a section uh, called my modules. When you go there, you will find introduction to real estate and you will find the documents that we went through this week listed there. So I really encourage everyone to register. Uh, let me just try and find that link for for registration if if you go to the website www.bmoinstitute.co.za there'll be a section that's written apply then when you apply you must specifically apply for introduction to real estate so then all the 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 materials that you see here they will only be loaded uh friday after 2000 so this will be this powerpoint presentation in pdf and all the related activities and videos. They will be loaded Friday, 2000. Thank you. Hello. OK, any, any other Hello. questions? Yes. Um, Zanele here, ne? Yes. Rina, I would like to ask that um, when the person who just spoke now, I didn't get his name, do it's I need to be registered? Do I need to be registered with Permit or with BMO Institute for me to get the the material that is here? No, this is BMO Institute. Sorry, I, I was actually very naughty to bring Permit in, 
But this okay. the whole program is uh, purely for BMORE Institute, and this is where the, uh, we are accredited and um, we are doing the NQF for training through here. And through uh, be more, be more. Um, uh, if you are in a state agent here, or you register for NKF four at be more, you can be registered as an estate agent at any other company. Okay. But but if they, there is some people that that did contact me and they've got problems to register, so with format we can help them. But um, it's not a necessity. It's not. Yeah. I just want to mention something else about the training, and I saw that this uh, this afternoon there was quite a few people at the stage. There was thirty eight people uh, on on the uh, group. And um, our um, Mr. Matamala, the owner and the founder for the Bmore Group, with um, Moses and the group. I I must apologize. I sometimes battle with all the surnames, so please forgive me for that. Um, so we they going to. Um, I have a special on for the people who sign up for the uh, train, training sessions. And I'm going to read what he said to me. Okay. We, are, we, all, we need also a program to, for the marketing campaign. So if you can do a very good marketing study for us. Say, for instance, you decide you are going to sell um what what do you want to sell hair pieces for the women i see there's quite a lot of women here hair pieces and you do a very good marketing report on a uh, market study on the hair pieces or maybe something special something that somebody didn't think about the first five people to sign up for the three courses there's bursary for the person who does the activities and they seek capital up to 100,000 for the best business plan across the three courses. I saw that he didn't put here, he promised, and I, I, I did hear it somewhere, that he will give himself up for a mentor for, the, for somebody that will um, be, uh, 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 that they choose for the best marketing com uh, campaign. How does that sound? Marina, yes. I, I, propose, I propose this. Uh, since now, uh, Mr. Matamala apologized for the, for the previous two days. He just had something to attend, hence he couldn't attend the class. I think let's leave that for Friday. So Friday, we're just going to take uh, the rest of the team through the full prospectors and those uh, service offerings that he just presented. We'll put them nice on a PowerPoint presentation and we will take everyone through. Then after that, we'll also put that on the LMS. Then the people, uh, then everyone can download those and do according to the instructions that will be communicated on Friday. So I propose that let's let's attend that on on Friday so that everyone can just get a full clarity and we answer all those questions there. Because right now there might be some that we might not be able to answer as he's not here. Is that okay? That's 100% okay with me, and I think we plant the seeds so they will, can look forward to it. 100%. Is there any questions before we close down? No Dolly? questions on me. No Thank questions you, on my side. Everybody.